Hello there. How's everybody doing today? Doing good. How are you? Doing pretty well. Got a headache though. So it takes a minute really quick. Just one second. Do you have anything in particular that you wanted to cover today? What I plan on covering is the drawing tools and how to draw or trace out a drawing. Everything ready here. But if you have anything in particular that you want to cover, just let me know and we'll do that too. Uh, I did have one question about uh, when I was trying to open up a DXF file. Okay. Um, it, it imports like in a, a lot smaller size than what it originally is. Yeah, I could show you how to do that. Okay. Um, do you happen to have one that you want uh, to email me and I can open up on my end or do you want to, I mean, they should all work about the same, but if you do have one, I can open it up and show you what I would do on my end. Yeah, I can email it to you. Okay, go ahead and send it off and then we'll... Just uh, Cameron at memorialdesigner.com? Yep. Okay. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. All right, so while you're emailing that, I'm going to going to do here just a minute to find it I think the picture is actually texted to me so let me look through my text messages okay Okay, so I've got this image uh, that was texted to me. I use the Your Phone app on Windows to synchronize my text messages between my phone and my computer. So I was able to just get to that from there. And then I will do a paste. I'm just copying and pasting, but I'll do a paste special um, just because sometimes pasting for some reason doesn't like to work. So with paste special, I can choose bitmap and that'll paste it in that way. So the question was how to draw something like this. Uh, so normally what I would do is I'd go ahead and start with my shape, uh, the shape of my stone, depending on how big it was. So let's say we were going 24 by 24 on a 36 inch base. Um, then I bring this and usually I'll crop it. If I don't need any of this extra stuff, I'll just kind of crop it down to what I do need. You double click to crop and then I place it where I want to have it on the stone. Something like this. And every once in a while, um, I will grab this and then I'll just hit the invert selection button. What that does is it selects everything other than what I'm working on. And then I can go up to object, hide and say hide. And that way it's going to hide everything other than what I'm working on. And then that way I can just work on this without worrying about anything else um, on the screen. I usually do that too, because on, on whatever I'm working on, I will uh, typically make this a little bit transparent so that what I'm doing, I can see better. Um, 
And then I'll also usually lock this so that I don't accidentally grab it when I'm trying to draw. So those are a couple uh, steps that I'd take to begin with in order to get this the way that I want it to be. Um, from there, just a second here. Okay, so from there, we would grab one of these drawing tools um, and start drawing. <clears throat> the freehand tool is not usually one that I would use for something like this because I'm going to end up making more than one um, curve or more than one line. Um, I like to use the freehand tool if I'm doing something really quick, like just you know drawing something like that or making a click here to there because you can do a straight line if you just click and release, move over and then click again to end. That gives you a straight line. Or if you click and drag, then that'll give you a curve. So I could technically, if I wanted to, um, just kind of grab this, come around like this, and curve and come around like this, and then end it about there. But I find that that's not super clean. So then I'd have to end up coming back here and deleting nodes. If you double click a node, it'll delete it. Um, or you can come over and grab like the smooth tool, maybe make that a little bit bigger, start smoothing it like this. That's not too bad, but it doesn't really fit a curve anymore. So there's still, you know, more cleanup or more moving around than I'd want to. Um, so normally I'm not gonna use the free hand for something like this, okay? Usually I'm going to use the polyline tool. The reason for that is that it's similar to the free hand, except that I can, as I click, um, it will continue the stroke. Uh, I guess I could have said here with free hand as well, that if I wanted to, I could do straight line segments. So I can come here and then I'll click and then I'll click again and click, and then I'll click again and click. So every time, if you want it to stay closed, you have to come back up and click back on that so that you can keep it closed. And then I'll end it there. So you can go about it that way as well. Um, but I find it faster for me anyway, to just use polyline and go like that, click, 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 and click, and then I'll be done. You double click to end, sorry, I should have. Should have done that. So I find it easier to go ahead and just click basically wherever the, um, the curve is changing direction. And then I would double click or hit control A. Usually I'll hit control A to select all the nodes. You can see they turn blue. They were white before. If I hit control A, they turn blue. Same thing if I double click the shape tool, that will make them turn blue. And so now they're all selected. And what that lets me do is it lets me turn them to from those straight line uh, segments to curved segments. So if I switch them over to curved segments, then I've got the ability to click on these and bend them the way that I want. And depending on where you grab it, that's where it's gonna bend. So if I grab over here, it's gonna bend more that way. If I grab in the middle, it'll bend more that way. If I click on a node, I can grab the handle and that gives me more control over how that bends. So I would just bend it like this. And I find it much easier for something like this to draw basically at the center of where I would be as opposed to anywhere else. Um, because what we're going to do is we're just gonna apply a line thickness to it once we're done. Um, and that will give us our double line. Otherwise, we'd have to start on one end and then we'd either contour or draw the other. If you manually draw the other end, it's not gonna be consistent all the way around. So I would typically just do something like this. And then I've got a quick button up here for line width. Um, the reason I use this line width button is because it is set for the line thickness that I like. So if I hold control and click on it, it gives me a little line width dialog tells me how thick that is. You don't have to do it that way. You can actually choose just from the outline width here um, how thick you want it to be. You can also see down here in the corner, um, if we click on this, what our outline width is. And you can double click 
and it'll show up here as well. That takes a little more clicks though. So I would normally just do it up here. And if I wanted to do something like an eighth of an inch, I could type that in. You can also, if you want to do math, you can do one divided by eight inches and hit enter. You should be able to. Let's try it with one sixteenth, see what happens. Maybe you can't. You used to be able to do that. Huh. All right, maybe that doesn't work in outline width. So we'll just do the numbers. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, if we uh, want it to have thickness, then that's what you need to do is change your thickness. Now this little node right here, I want to move it a little bit, but it's, it's trying to snap um, to the line or snap to itself. And so if I want to move it a little bit, um, because I have snapping on, the option is to either turn snapping off and then move it, or I find it more helpful because I use snapping almost all the time um, to just hold the letter Q on the keyboard while I'm moving it. And that temporarily disables snap. And that only works in uh, newer versions of CorelDRAW. So if you're on an older version, that won't work. Um, but on your newer versions, it does. So again, right here, it's trying to snap. So I would come down here, holding Q and get it to where I want it to go. Um, there's also, because this was originally created with um, straight line segments, these nodes were cusped nodes. And there's an alternative node mode called smooth, where if we switch it over to a smooth node, it'll give us a little bit more of a smooth curve there. Um, and the same thing over here if we grab that one. But instead of hitting the button, I'm just going to hit the keyboard shortcut, which is C on the keyboard, because C on the keyboard will switch it. It's a toggle. It toggles from either a cusp to a smooth. If I hit it again, it'll go back to cusp. So that is a keyboard shortcut for switching between those node modes. Anyway. So we've got that um, taken care of. And in the, in the original, it's quite a bit thicker. So I might want to make this a little bit thicker, um, you know, somewhere around a quarter of an inch or so, maybe not quite so big, maybe 0.2, something like that. And then we've got these lines here. So I'm going to do it two different ways. And I also probably want to make it so that these um, pieces here are going to line up with each other a little better. If they were all the way connected, right, then we'd want it to match up. I think that'll be all right. I'll just hold Q and move that just slightly this way. OK, so with these ones, same thing. If I grab this, I can, well, I'm going to show you a different tool. Uh, let's do the Bezier. So with Bezier, you click. And this is not one that I use very often, so I'm not very good at it. Um, but you click and not do that. You click once here, and then you click again, and you bend it while you're clicking. So you're clicking to the end and then bending it uh, like that. Can't remember exactly how to get it to turn into a cusp, though. So I don't know if it does. I think if you hit C, it'll cusp. Maybe. We'll bend it like that, and we'll come back to here and bend it like that. So that bends at the same time while you're drawing. Um, I don't know. There's there's just something about it that, for me, doesn't uh, doesn't work out as well as if I were to just draw straight lines and then bend them later. So I'm going to end up coming back here and, and doing that anyway. This node here is symmetrical. And because it's symmetrical, it's got to be the exact same on either side. Um, and maybe that's just the way that Bezier works as it builds symmetrical nodes. Um, so if I wanted to curve this different from that one, it wouldn't work out unless I change that node type. Um, 
And that's actually okay because we kind of want it to be symmetrical anyway. Okay, so that's one way of going about it. The other way that I would normally do it, if I've got a line that comes to a point on either end, I'd usually grab the artistic media tool because what that lets you do is it lets you draw a preset stroke and you can choose how you want that uh, the ends to end up, no pun intended. Um, but you can grab, let's say this one here, and you're basically just drawing the line from here to here freehand, and then it's going to bend that, or it's not going to bend it, it's going to give you those ends the way that you want them to be. Um, I don't really need that one. I don't really need that one, so I'll just double click and get rid of those. And that's maybe not as thick as the other one, so if I grab this, before we had it at 0.2 inches, right? So if we type in 0.2, then the thickest point should be 0.2. If you go up a little, you can either click on these to make them go up and down, or you can click in between and then it acts as a slider. So you can go up and down that way if you wanna thicken it up. But that then gives you those points at either end. The downside to this um, is that, and the downside to this as well, is if we go to wireframe view, so I'm just going to hit V to go to wireframe. Um, we've got an inside line. That's the actual line that we've drawn. And then it's got an effect applied to that. So this has that outside, outside effect. This one, you don't actually see the outline in wireframe mode. Um, and so we're, uh, hold on just one second. Hi, Daddy. Hey. Okay. Love you. All right, have a good day. Okay, so in this um, particular mode, if you if we wanted to be able to cut this, right, because we're drawing it interactively, then we need to convert these lines in order to get them to cut. So we'll talk about that here in just a little bit, but there is a difference between those. Um, this one, since we just drew both sides of the line, there's nothing that we need to do for that to get it to cut because it's already drawn the way that we want it to be drawn. And technically we could have, so if we grab this and move it over, we could have just taken this one and copied it up to here. Now if they're gonna be the same, like that. Um, but I was trying to show you different modes or different ways of drawing it anyway. So that's why I've got two different ones. Okay, so because this is built off of individual lines, um, and I would actually normally take that, take this one and make a copy of it. The reason for that is because now I've got this design that I can move and I can resize it. And those line thicknesses are gonna stay the same because the way that they're drawn on a single line, um, the thickness is gonna stay the same amount. Instead of uh, proportionally getting smaller or larger, that thickness is gonna stay the same. And so we can make that bigger or smaller and maintain our sandblast width. If we wanted to change that sandblast width to 0 0.09, like we had before, and maybe do the same thing for these. If we take these ones and change that width to 0 0.09, Then as we make it smaller, I can go quite a bit smaller with this and still have that sandblastable um, because that line thickness is maintaining. So that's why I would keep, if I were drawing this, I would actually keep a version of it um, like this and I would keep it um, with the lines the way that they are. So I would usually at this point go up here and say, save as. And then I would choose select it only because that is, I, I only want the piece that I'm saving. And then I would save this to wherever my uh, artwork is that I'm going to save. So let's go. We'll go into here. And then I've got a scalable um, folder there as well. 
I'll just call this infinity symbol or something like that. You can also tag it infinity, whatever, this, whatever. As we tag it, then we can search for those things later. And I would end up changing the file name to a number anyway, because that's how I uh, ultimately save my symbol to. I ultimately will change it to a number. So that's why I want infinity at least in the uh, tags, so that when I change that to a number, it's not going to lose that. And then I'll click Save. So by doing that, that saves that. Uh, to a file that I can later use and bring in whenever I want. Um, I've also got it over here, I believe. I don't know if I've got it currently, but I'll, when it opens up, we'll, we'll take a look at that real quick. It's going to take a second for it to load up all these assets. And this is new, just so you know, to 2021.5. Um, they've renamed the connect content Docker to assets now um, because it's also got access now to your online um, cloud assets if you save things to the Corel cloud. So if I go, no, I don't have it here, so that's fine. But I'll show it to you here really quick. If I went to add new, create alias, and went to my Sandblast collection, and then I add that folder. Now all of those designs are gonna show up here under Classic Collection 2021. And then I can scroll through them and you know see what I've drawn, or I can search now, infinity. It's taking a while to type. That was fun. I just crashed curl draw. So let's reopen. Hopefully, I didn't lose anything. So when it popped back up, it asks, uh, it says, curl draw found in an auto backup. Would you like to open it? So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And Corel by default opened up on the other screen. That's why you can't see it, but I'll move it over here. And so it looks like we, we lost a little bit of it, um, but that's okay, because I can just go back and go to import. And we'll go back to our artwork here. Re-import it. We'll get rid of this one. And then just throw this back where it was. Just like that. So I'm not sure why it crashed. I'll have to take a look at that later to see. But okay, so we've got that now. And what I would do to make this sandblastable is um, this one, which is a single line with an outline applied to it. You go up to object and you say convert outline to object. And what that does is it takes your single line and converts it to a UW line for you. These ones, the artistic media, you go up to object and well, you have to have both pieces selected. You go up to object and say break artistic media group apart. And then you'd have to click on the center line and delete it. So I've actually got a macro that will do that for you if you select all your strokes and you just hit the comma button on the keyboard it will automatically break it apart and delete the center lines for you all at the same time. So I use that more often than not. And then these ones, um, I'd probably add a node here and maybe bring this up just because I think it's going to look better if this is a little bit more um, parallel with the other existing line there. So I'd maybe do something like that. And now we've got that design that we can put on our headstone. So we will unlock this, delete that original. We'll go back to object, hide and show all. And now it's going to show up exactly where it was. Normally at this point, I would combine all those pieces together. 
And depending on if this was going on a you know, darker stone or a lighter stone, uh, my guess is it would go on a darker one. So I'm going to actually fill it in with white. That way when I fill this in, I will fill it in the, the correct way. Now you'll notice that I've got my secondary fill, my secondary stain set for gold leaf. So if I wanted to change that, I can just right click and change it back to white and then it'll fill it back in with white. All right. So that's how I would go about drawing something like that. Any questions on that? There's also still, a, when it converts your outline to object, there's normally more nodes than I would need. So I'd come in here and reduce those nodes or just change my curve smoothness to something a little bit more smooth. And that way I'd get rid of some of those nodes as well. All right, so Macy sent me a DXF design. So I've got an email open and I'm just going to go to the DXF and hit open. Now when the DXF is being opened in Corel Draw, it comes up with this um, import dialog. Most of the time it's, autom it's set for automatic for the units. And because of that, it doesn't do a good job of matching it up to uh, whatever it was supposed to be life size before. So you'll see the original size, eight and a half by 5.67. It's not correct. So if we switch this over to English, then it'll end up at 30 by 20 inches. If we switch it to metric, it'll be really, really small. So that's not right. So just by switching it from automatic to English um, should then make it so that we can import this or open it up at the correct size. DXF files normally come in when they come in, they're normally um, kind of broken up. This one's actually pretty decent. Um, so this is okay. Um, when I bring in a DXF file though, normally my first thing that I do is hit the DXF fix button. And that's because what it will do is it will go and look for any um, holes or breaks in the design and it'll close those in for us. <clears throat> then I've got to change this um, outline to polish, and then I've got to change this inside stuff. I'd grab it and then just hit fill grayscale, and that would then fill it in this way, the way that I need it to be done. So in just a couple of clicks, we're able to get that taken care of. Um, I might pull out this portion behind there. Sometimes um, it looks better to have that stay polished, so I'll knock that out on, by, on either side. Just knock out, knock out, knock out, and then I'll hit escape to end my knockout. If you don't hit escape to end your knockout, then you're gonna run into some trouble. So just remember to hit escape. Um, and then I would just save that file and it would be good to go. So I'd, I'd save it and tag it with the dogwood, cross, circle, that sort of stuff. Thank you, that helps a lot. You're very welcome. So on your other one, Let's open it up. You said you can't get it to fill. So let's take it a look. It was the same one. I think I probably just wouldn't uh, hit the, the the gray or whatever because it, it came in as the black. Yeah. So, um, so I think that was the problem. Yeah. yeah so DXF fix, um, the way that it works is after it's done closing things, then it runs this tool, which is fill grayscale. And right now, fill grayscale is not smart enough to know that there's a difference between a full layout and an individual design. So yeah. if this didn't have, if we didn't have the stone shape when we did it, you know, if we got rid of this, let's break this up and break it all apart. If we had gotten rid of the stone shape first and then hit DXF fix, it's going to work the way that I would want it to, because it's basically finding the largest object, filling that in with black, and then combining all the inside objects and filling those in with 10% gray. Um, but when you throw in the extra logic of a full stone shape, that's when it gets confused. And hopefully in a future update, we'll be able to add that logic in that if there's, you know, a big shape larger than the other ones that it'll go ahead and fill that in differently. We just haven't ever gotten to the point of doing that. So when you click the DXF fix button, you would end up changing this to polish 
and then re-clicking fill grayscale on these inside pieces. And then it would be able to fill. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about um, is just the difference between a filled view and a wireframe view, because a lot of times people will uh, want to export something to another program or they want to print it or whatever the case may be. And they're not quite sure how to get just a, you know, an outline view of things because when you hit wireframe, it, it gives you that only outline look. It's like um, really what wireframe is showing you is an x-ray of your design. It's, you know, if, if you were looking at a human body and looked through an x-ray machine as opposed to just your eyes, it, it looks different. Even though you're not changing anything at all, um, you're able to see, see it with a different view. And that's really what going to view and wireframe or enhanced does is just gives you a different view, okay? If you go to normal, which I don't really like because normal doesn't give you anti-aliasing. So all of your edges are, you know, pretty, um, they're, they're just straight and jagged, where if we go to enhanced view, it actually anti-aliases, which means that it blends the pixels uh, so that it looks smoother. Um, and so those are the two views that I use most often is just wireframe and enhanced. And that's why we've got this toggle view button where you just hit V to go from one to the other. But if I wanted to export and only show this view, it's not going to work because that's only a view mode. It's not, we've not changed the colors at all. So if you wanna export it or print it or whatever, you actually have to change the colors of your design. An easy way of doing that would be to just grab, grab it and hit the plot page button because that will create a second page and remove all those fills and just leave you with the black outlines. But if we didn't want to create a second page, we could take our original page and select everything. And basically what those tools are doing is it is left clicking, uh, right clicking on the, um, on the no fill swatch because now it's gonna basically be invisible. And then it's right clicking on black, which gives you just outlines. So if you wanted to do it manually, those are the steps. Um, if you wanted to thicken it up a little bit, so we could go right click, left click, right click. And then instead of point five points, we could say, you know, four points or something. And that's going to then thicken that up a little bit, maybe two points. Um, and just make those outlines a little bit thicker so that when it prints, it's going to print, you know, a little bit more uh, distinguishable. So totally up to you how you'd want to do it, but you do need to change the actual colors of your objects in order to get it to either print or um, export to a file. But now that I've done that, I've, you know, messed with my original, so I can't go and fill this in anymore because it no longer has those correct grays scale values. Um, so you wouldn't want to save it this way, probably. You can always step back and control Z until you get back to before you started doing that. Um, or just not save it, you know, save it before you go to that mode and then not save it. So uh, Macy, just so you know, there is just looking at this design. Um, if we look at this portion of your, your band or your banner, okay, um, the line thicknesses change. So if we look here and we measure from here to here, uh, I'm going to go to the, what's it called, properties. And the length of that is 0 0.089 inches. So that's, you know, right where you want it to be. But if we look over like right here, then it is 0.12 inches. So your line thickness is uh, changing based on where that's curving. Um, so if it were me, I would actually, the, I think the reason that it's changing is this inside line itself is changing. Um, because if we measure that, if I go from here to here, that's telling me it's 0.22 inches. And if I do the same thing over here, it's 
uh, 0.178 inches. So it's the inside line is thinner, right? Um, so I would, if it were me, probably redo this banner um, so that it's more consistent. Um, there's a couple different ways of doing that. I'm trying to think what I would want to do. Uh, we'll, we'll do it a couple different ways, okay? So first, I'm just going to make a copy. And often, I'll just make copies if I want to not mess with the original. So I will make a copy. And I'm going to erase the section from here to here so that I can then use this one for what I'm going to do. Um, and I also want to double check just to see what the width is here, 0 0.41 inches. We'll come over to here. And the reason I'm snapping to perpendicular is so that I can make sure it's the same um, same width everywhere. So pretty close, right? That's that's looking good. So the outline is okay. It's just that inside line that's that's a little messed up. So we'll grab this outside line and we're going to take the contour tool and we're going to do an inside contour, which is already set, and we're going to do it at 0 0.09 inches. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a contour to the inside. And then we'll go up to object and we'll break that contour apart. So now we've got a new object right here. That's the inside area. And if I fill it in with 10% gray, you'll see how that works. Okay. But we don't need this portion of it. Um, we don't need this portion of it because we've already got that. So I would just take the eraser tool and erase all that stuff that I don't need. Okay. So just get rid of it. Do the same thing over on this side, just erase all that. So now I've got a new bar and I've got my original and they're just overlapping. Okay. So normally I would, usually when I'm erasing, I'm going to erase so that there's just a, barely an overlap on that side and this side's already pretty much that way anyway, but I'll just erase it so there's just barely an overlap. And with both of them overlapping, if we grab both, so I just held shift to grab both, we can weld it and it's going to then fix that uh, area there and fix that area too. So we've welded both of those pieces together and now we have fixed that uh, inside curve there so that it looks nicer. Um, there's still, I mean, looking at the design, there, there are other areas that do that too. So right here's a little thicker, right here's a little thinner. Um, so if I really wanted to, you know, be picky about it, I might break this up. Uh, and change the design a little bit. So I could grab this one that we had fixed and See, got rid of that. Good. Now, instead of going to the inside, go to the outside. Break that apart. And that's going to give us a little nicer line there. Um, I don't know. There's different things you can do to, to redraw those lines or, or get it to work nicely. Um, if we combine all of these things together first, then when we, so if we combine, let's do this, let's break this apart and then combine this and this. We're gonna combine all those together, okay? And then if we were to contour to the outside, then it should be more consistent. Um, should have left the original so that we could see how different it was. Let's, let's grab this one over here. Take a look and see if it was. I'm just going off of what my eye sees as opposed to anything else. But you can see there how the 
those lines don't match up. And over here, how it's a little bit thinner or a little bit thicker. So I would normally, um, if I notice anything like that, go ahead and fix it. These inside lines here, um, we're not gonna keep all those. And so I'm going to break apart the design and holding shift, I would click on the stuff that I wanted to keep. So I wanna keep, um, this line here, this line here, and that's all I want to keep. So then I'll just hit delete and it will delete everything else that I created other than this new line that I had created or these two pieces that I'd created. Um, so then if I grab those two pieces and combine them to this one, then it will refill in the way that it was before. But then that ends up saying, well, now I change that side. What about this side, right? Um, so if, if you've done one side and you want to make it the same on either, what I would normally do is I'd grab my piece and I don't really want the panel. So I'm holding shift while dragging a box around it to delete the panel pieces. And I would combine it all together. Okay. And then I'll take a line like this or a box like this. And basically I'm going to, um, come in here and... Snap this to the middle of my design, which oops, the middle is going to be right there at that node. So if I take this and grab, I guess I'll go this direction grab this and I will trim it. And it's gonna cut out this half. And if I grab this one and just mirror it, I just hold M and mirror it to the other side. And then I grab this one and hit W, it'll weld those back together. And then I'll hit F to refill it. And now it's back to the way that it should be, but um, now has a little nicer curves there. So like if I wanted to use that same uh, piece on like a smaller size stone, uh, do you have a video that shows how to do that? Or would that be, would you have to like redraw a bunch of stuff or how hard would that be? Yeah, so it depends on how small you want it to go, right? Um, because if we changed this, it's 48 inches right now. If we changed it to 36 by 20, for instance, okay. Then obviously it's too big, right? And so you've got you've got a couple of different choices. One is you can take everything that you had before and scale it. So if you grab it in a corner and drag it down, then it's going to scale proportionally. And then you can see whether or not that's going to fit. Um, if you're going from 48 and 24, okay, and you're going to 36 and 20. If you take this and scale it down, it's going to end up being um, longer just by scaling it down. It's, it's still going to be a little bit too long, right? Um, by scaling proportionally. So you can see from this that there's not as much um, space on the end as there is here. And that's just because of the way that, that it's scaling. Um, but you can decide whether or not that matters too much to you. Um, you also have to, if you're scaling it down, remember that every time you scale something down, these lines now are becoming thinner. So if I check that line thickness, it's now 0 0.071 inches instead of the 0 0.09 inches. So we'll do it two different ways um, so that we can decide which way we like better. We'll do it that way, and then we'll also do it another way here where we just grab it and move the pieces over. 
Um, this looks to me too big for that corner. So I would probably end up scaling it anyway, slightly, any, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd make it a little bit smaller just because it just looks massively out of proportion. But we'll go ahead and bring it to about there. And then we will mess with it from there. So um, this inside line that we had created, right? And we'll kind of do something similar to what we did before. But what we will do is we will combine everything first and then we will erase all of that right there. We'll break that apart so that we can grab this stuff all by itself. And if I was fitting to this, I mean, you can do, um, this is another drawing tool, the three point curve. I gotta let my dog out real quick, just one second. Okay, so if we uh, use the straight, uh, the three point tool, the way that it works is you basically come in here and click where you want it to start. And you come over this way and make another click. And then you would click up here at the top for your top line. I zoomed too far in for that. So you'd click over, you click once click and drag, sorry. So you click and drag and then you move it up and click again to end it. Um, so that's one tool that you can use if you're trying to draw a curve. Or what I would normally do is I just grab the stone shape itself and using the interactive contour, I would just drag and pull down a line, maybe to there. And that way my curve is actually gonna fit the curve of my stone I break that apart so that I can get to this all by itself. And then I get rid of a lot of these nodes that I don't need. That'll just give me a line there. But we've got to decide how we want that to, you know, kind of bend in order to make it really look prettier. So I might go like this. And again, I'm just going to do a center line and then I'll work my way out from there. So I would grab a center line like that. And then I would, uh, I'd first measure whatever this thickness is. So I would go from here to here. And it's telling me it's 0.2 inches. So that's what I would do for my outline thickness on this is I would do 0.2 inches. That's gonna give me my center line. All right, and then when I've got that created, I'll just uh, go up to object, convert that outline to an object so I get my double line, and then I'll just turn that into a panel. So I'll just use the panels and spacing, do a single line panel and hit apply, and it will build um, my panel around what I had created. Oh, I got chopped off there now. That was really weird. Let me try that again. That's really odd. I don't know why it's chopping that off. Let's try this one instead, frosted outline. That one seemed to work. I'll have to play with that and see what's going on there. Um, yeah, my frosted outline seems to be a bit thin, so I'm going to look and see what my numbers were. I held control to get into that. We know 625 is definitely too thin, so I would not want to do that. We grab that and hit frosted out right again. Okay, so, and I guess I should have checked to, oh, we scaled this down a little bit, didn't we? So now it's a 0 0.07 inches. So I need to go, instead of 0 0.09, I need to go to 0 0.07. So I grab this, hold control and click on frosted outline and changes to 0.07. Okay. It frosted out right on that. Something like that. So that's one way of doing it. Um, but in order to get this to work, then I'm going to need to 
combine these together, right? And erase these ends. And then I would grab these pieces and weld them together. And then just need to clean it up here where they're welded. Just delete some of those nodes. So I've now got this section created. And then again, all I would do is the same thing that I did before, um, where I took this, should have gone this direction, and I trimmed this. And I can grab this one. And if you just flip it on itself and make a copy, you can do it that way as well. And then weld that to the other one and then fill it. And so I've done that, but again, it's thinner now, right? It's 0 0.07 inches instead of 0 0.09. So I would normally want 0 0.09 inch uh, line thicknesses. And so gosh, these panels don't quite look right either. It looks like this left side is thinner than the right side. So that's 0 0.082. And this is 0 0.082. That's just an optical illusion, I guess. Just so I don't want those panels combined. All I want is this outside stuff combined. So I grab, I grab all of that. And I'm just going to make a reference line. So I'll grab my my freehand to create a reference. And we'll see again if we go back to properties docker and look at the curve length, it's 0 0.07. So if we want this to be 0 0.09, we'll shift select this and run blastable on it so that it thickens that up. And we'll hope that everything over then, everything on this side and everything on the other side then also look well. So what that did was it did the math between the 0 0.09 seven that it was, the 0 0.09 that I wanted it to become, and did a contour. Uh, so it thickened it up. And it's just ever so slightly, but it does make a difference when you're sandblasting. So we would do that. And we'd do the same thing for these panels. Um, if we wanted to make sure that they were a consistent line thickness with the rest of our design, we're just going to grab them. And well, so there's two options. One is to grab them and um, re-thicken them up. But if I really wanted to make sure they were consistent with the rest of the design, I could go back and remeasure this. So it is 0.179, basically 0.18 inches. So if I broke this apart and deleted all of these lines other than this inside one, I could go back to the panels and spacing docker and choose to make a panel that's got a 0.09 hard line, but a double line panel that has a bar line that is 0.19. Is that what it was before? Um, I don't want the scallops either. And that would then rebuild the panel to match the same um, thickness as this one, if I remembered correctly. That was 0.18, so I'm a little bit off. So we'll just go back to this and instead choose 0.18 and then apply. And by doing that, that's going to give us the same thickness for our bar line as this is, um, so that it's just more consistent with the rest of the design. So we could do the same thing for all of these ones too. Um, or I might just, if I just redraw that line, pull it back over here. Then I can just apply the same thickness to there, mirror that one, center that one. Or if we group all these, now, now that they're, they're groups, okay, then we can grab all of those and use quick distribute to distribute between this edge and this edge. And that way we're gonna get even spacing between each of those. If you don't group them first, then it tries to distribute each individual object and you won't have enough space for it to work. So 
So there's that same design on a smaller uh, 36 um, by 18 in, or 36 by 20 stone. Um, that's probably how I'd go about doing it is this way. Or if we do it this method where we just simply um, scaled everything down, right? Then I would do what we had done before where we combine everything together, draw a reference line, shift select, run blastable. And that way it will proportionally thicken everything back up. This is a little bit faster method for sure, because all we did was shrink it down and, and then change our V lines. Um, and that works okay on a, you know, 36 inch stone, if we really wanted to do the same design um, on something different. And this is new functionality for the latest beta version of Memorial Designer. I should be able to grab that shape, I think, and click on it and say, yes, I want to replace this existing shape. Um, change it to, let's say, 24 by 24 on a 36 inch base. Look okay. Let's see if it worked. Yeah, so it actually worked where we changed just this shape, but not any of the others. That's cool. I like, I like it when things work. And obviously, it's only a single, so we're not going to have all of those. And this would need to be a lot shorter. Um, with panels like this, if we just make them shorter, okay, it's going to change and mess up the lines that we've got here, because it's shrinking those in. So these are now messed up. Doesn't mess up the top portions, but it does mess up those ones. But just to be quick, if you really wanted to do that, you can. You just go back and reapply um, after that your lines, and it would then fix it for you. So we've got that panel. And then again, we've got this corner design that we would need to um, go back through those same steps of combining, breaking or erasing this. And let's maybe mirror that to the other side. Yeah, this doesn't look too bad if we bring this up like that. We might be able to just create I'm going to try something really quick just because it's it's an interesting idea. If we take this and delete, delete, we're going to grab this. I'm going to say delete and delete. OK, so now we've got open. If we look at the thing, we've got these open paths here. Well, there is a tool called the join curves where if we take both of these, OK, I'm going to click on this node. I'm going to hold control and click on this node. So now I've got just those. Maybe I don't. I might have to combine them together first. Let's go ahead and combine it together first. So I've got this one here. And I'm going to hold control and click on this one here. And that should add both of those nodes to my selection, I thought. Yeah, so I've got both of those nodes. And then if we go to join curves, we should be able to do a Bezier curve with a really big gap tolerance. That's, I don't know, let's do like a 30 inch gap tolerance. It's going to redraw that curve for us um, to close it off. So we would just do that for each of these pieces. And if we do it for them individually, it should connect those lines correctly the way that we want them to go. We'll just hit F to fill it. Look at that magic. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So different ways of going about it. Um, and then obviously, if this is just for one or two people, I might just you know redraw another panel down here and then go over to panels and spacing and rebuild my panel. And I want to center that on the stone. So now all of a sudden we've got 
different versions of that same design. And I'll go ahead and save it just because we did some work on that. And I'll just put it to my desktop for now. And I'm going to down save it just because in case you're not on that same version, down save it to 2017, which is the latest one that I um, support. And I'm not going to save any of the granite fill stuff in it because I just want grayscale. So I'm going to say no. And then we should have that shape that I can share with you and you can do what you want with it. Any questions on any of that? Um, let's see, Derek asked if I use ruler guides. So guidelines, I'm assuming you're talking about guidelines like these things up here. You grab from the ruler and pull in that way. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, I don't use guidelines a lot. Sometimes I do if, you know, if, if, so I can pull down a guideline and make sure that if I've got text, let's say I've got text over here, and you can also snap the guidelines, which is nice. So if I had some text over here, but then I had created some other text and I wanted to make sure that this text was aligned the same place, you know, I'd use a guideline for that kind of stuff. Um, or I would just take my text and mirror it. So there's just so many different ways of going about it that um, most of the time, if I'm working on one side of the design, you know, whatever I'm going to put on the other side of the design is going to be just mirrored. And so I use mirror probably more often than anything, but occasionally I'll use guidelines. Um, there are also interactive guidelines, which if you go to view and say alignment guides, you can check that box. And what that does is it will um, basically give you interactive guides as you bring stuff down. Um, it finds other pieces in your design and then it will, you know, uh, short term draw a, a guide for you. I Sometimes those are pretty cool because like this, it's going to tell me that I've got even spacing between different things, which is pretty neat, right? It's centering between those. That's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but I don't use guidelines a ton, and I don't really like them on my screen, so I more often than not will just hit my delete all guidelines button to get rid of them. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just not a regular part of my workflow to have guidelines. I think this looks a little too thick, so I'd probably stretch that down a little bit and reapply. All right, any questions on that? I think that uh, gets us to time for today. Um, so I will end this session. Macy, it's good to see you. Good to have you here. Uh, thanks for coming. And Derek, as always, it's good to have you as well. Um, so we will see you next week. And let me know if you have any questions before then. Thank you. Have a good week, Ian. You too. Bye. Bye.